good morning, everyone. My name's Eric. I'm one of the pastors here at uh, New King Church. And uh, if you have started attending here in the last couple months, you're probably looking at me saying, who is this guy, and where did you come from, because I've never seen you before. Well, uh, I want to tell you, on uh, March 1st of this year, my wife and I loaded up our car and our little camper, and we took off to the southwest for two months of travel and hiking and relaxation, and it was a phenomenal time. We drove 9,058 miles in the two months that we were gone. We came back uh, a week or so ago, and uh, we spent a lot of time in New Mexico, uh, Arizona, Utah, hiking, and we just enjoyed God's creation. We, every Sunday, we went to another church and experienced Christians along the road. It was just a wonderful time. And first off, I want to thank New King, and particularly the leadership, because when I tell them, hey, I'm gone for two months, I'm kind of wondering what's going to happen, and uh, their response was wonderful. Have a great trip. Go with our blessing. So thank you to New King. And uh, so if I, I see a lot of new faces, please introduce yourself to me. I'd love to get to know you. Uh, ben had to do that when I got back. He's like, I'm Ben. Don't you remember? You know, I'm a little old. I, I'm the guy with the hair. Remember me? It's like, oh, yeah, I do remember you. So that's a little bit about me. And as Lucia said, we're starting this new series uh, in Genesis. As you know, we did we did Matthew, whole book of Matthew, whole gospel of Matthew, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. And now it feels like the Lord is leading us to spend some time in the Old Testament. And uh, we feel clear that God is leading us to teach from, from Genesis. And um, I think what we're planning to do, as Lucia says, is, is 50 chapters we're not going to do a detailed uh, teaching from each and every chapter. We're going to pick some highlights. So this first section is, is chapters 1 through 11. We call it beginnings. Then we're going to look at the life of Abraham, 12 through 22. There might be, what, four or five sermons from that. And we might also, at times, jump into the New Testament to show why the Old Testament is important and why the truths of the Old Testament get fulfilled in the New Testament. Because if you read in the New Testament, we're all children of, children of Abraham. Abraham is our father. Well, okay, let's understand who Abraham is. So we're going to try to make that connection from time to time. And then after Abraham, we'll, we'll go 23 to 50 and look at Isaac. Um, we'll look at Jacob. We'll look at Joseph and have some selected sermons on those guys to see how God is, uh, is teaching us. So that's the thought. And um, I'm starting today uh, in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to do a little introduction to this story of creation. I'm going to actually only go through just a handful of verses. Uh, but the challenge that I have, the challenge that I have it's really two. One, the creation story is familiar to all of us. We can almost, in the beginning, God created. We know it so well, and when that happens, we tend to just say, yeah, I know that. The second thing that we do is we come particularly to Genesis, particularly to the creation story, with preconcep preconceptions, with ideas that we have. And what I really want to try to do today and over the next few weeks is have you see Genesis with fresh eyes. That's my prayer. That's my hope, that you would see it fresh for what it is and what it says. And so to start that off, um, I'd like to read the first several sections of it. I'm thinking maybe the first 13 verses and what I want you to do is to, like, pretend you're hearing it for the first time. Hear, hear the language that's used. Hear who is it that's acting, who is doing it. Hear, hear the cadence of the creation. So if you wouldn't mind standing for God's word, that's something if you're new here to New King, we, we, we stand when we read God's word to give it the respect and reverence. 
So I'm going to start. I'm going to read from verse 1 through 13. It's going to be up on the screen, so um, please follow along. And again, with fresh ears and fresh eyes. Are you ready? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the, under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven or sky, and there was evening. And there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. Let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, trees bearing fruit in which there is, is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening. And there was morning. The third day. This, my brothers and sisters, is God's word. Please, uh, please be seated. Let me pray uh, for the Lord's help as I teach this morning. Uh, Father God, I do pray that you would help me to preach the word clearly and accurately. I pray that you would prepare the hearts of the people to hear what you say in these first few verses of creation. Father, give me a peace. Give me a power. I pray I don't faint. I just ask that you would uh, be with us this morning as we read from this book of beginnings from Genesis. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, let's start off by um, talking about something very fundamental how do we interpret the Bible? How do we understand it? How do we teach it? How do we apply it? And we use here at New Fit King something called the historical grammatical approach. Historical grammatical. And what that means is we look at when the scripture was written, by who it was written, to whom it was written, and what was the context. We then look at the literary, the, the, the language that's used to see what the author's intent was back in the day to the people that received it. We look at the culture they were under. We look and, and, we look and see what, what circumstances were involved, right? Remember 2 Timothy. What did we do week after week after week? Start out, hey, remember, this is Paul's pastoral letter to this young man named Timothy. Where was Paul? He was in prison. He was facing execution. This was the last letter he wrote. 
Well, who was Timothy? Oh, he was Paul's beloved son in the faith. And Paul is writing this last letter to give him final instructions before he dies. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, maybe we better hear that. And we hear it in context. We talk about the fact that it is a pastoral letter. It's in the form of a letter from one person to a single person. It's not a congregational letter like the epistle to the Romans, which is written to a group of churches or a church in Rome. It has a little bit different flavor. When you look at it, some of the things that are said are very personal to Timothy, right? So, so we look at it there, and then what we do is we see what Paul says to Timothy in the context and culture of the day, and then, as good teachers, we then bring that forward to say, okay, I live in 2023, Greater Burlington, Vermont. How do I apply it? So I take the scripture written in time-space culture, and I bring it up, and I apply it to our culture and our lives. That's what I do. That's what we do at New King. We don't read Timothy and then say, well, the culture of the day teaches A, B, and C. I'm going to take that culture, bring it back to the, to the New Testament, and see if the Bible lines up with the culture of the day. No, we don't do that. You with me on that? You understand what I'm saying? We do the same thing with Genesis, right? We, we go back to the story of Genesis. We read it in the day and the culture it was written. We see what God says there using the language and the genre of literature that it is. And then we apply it to today. The problem with Genesis is we take all our preconceived notion, particularly about science. We bring it all back and we say, well, it doesn't line up. What am I going to do? Right? You've been there. It's difficult. It's hard. You can't do anything else. Look at the culture it's written in. Look at the words that it says. And bring it forward. And apply it to our lives today. That's the purpose. So with that said, the author of Genesis traditionally has been Moses. He wrote the first five books. When did he write it? Have you ever thought of that? You know, this goes back to the beginning. In the beginning it starts. When was it written? Written by Moses. When did Moses appear? Book of Exodus, the later book. When did he write it? He probably wrote it after the Israelites were released from captivity by the mighty hand of God, and they had been given the Ten Commandments, and they were in the wilderness. At some point, they were probably in the wilderness. You ever thought about that? How did he write it? Was he an eyewitness to the accounts? No, <laughs> he wasn't there. So similar to the Gospel of Luke, if you've looked at the Gospel of Luke, Luke starts out and he says, okay, so I think it's time I wrote down all about Jesus. I went and I researched. I looked at what was written. I went to eyewitnesses. I put it together, and here is this. And at the end, he says, and my, this is my primary purpose in writing. How did Moses write Genesis, particularly the creation story? We don't know. Most likely. He drew from st verbal stories that were passed down, from other written accounts, and very likely he probably had revelation directly from God. We have to be, we have to have integrity when we, when we talk about these things. That's probably how it was done. That's what scholars agree. That's probably how he did it. In the wilderness, after the fact, using the stories and traditions and writings passed down, and a revelation from God. Does that make sense to you? Th this is just important for us to be, to be realistic and real with what we have in front of us. And so, one more thing. What was the culture of the day? The Israelites are in the wilderness. They're, they're being led by Moses and Aaron. They're going from place to place. There's battles. There's conquerings. They have their doubts. They they, they complain and they whine the whole time and all that. But what was going on in the culture? First of all, from a religious standpoint, it was a situation 
um, in which there was polytheistic religion, multiple gods. And when you look at the creation stories written by the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and the Egyptians at that time, the worlds came into be through this this battle between the gods in which there was great cosmic forces and it ended up being a big battle and at the end of the day someone won and creation happened. That was the culture. So polytheistic. The cosmos started with a great battle between the gods, right? And the third thing I want to mention is when we look at the writings and, and, and the cosmology of that day and how they explain things, they were not necessarily concerned with material origins. What they were concerned with, all the writings show, with what was it going to do? If something was created, how did it function? What was its purpose? That was the John, that was the, the culture that they were that the, it was written in. That was what was happening at the time. They weren't they weren't really thinking about material origins like we tend to think. So we have to understand that. And the genre of Genesis is written in the form of historical narrative. Historical narrative based upon actual events written by people in an ancient culture and told in a series of stories. As you go through Genesis, you will come across the phrase 11 times, these are the generations of Adam. These are the generations of Noah. And so it's this historical na narrative about actual people that lived in an actual time, and the stories are, are written down and published. And just because I use the term story, it doesn't mean that it's fiction. <laughs> it's a historical narrative. It's based upon true things that happened to true people, right? And these stories have theological purpose. One more thing. These stories have theological purpose. The reason that they're written down is to illustrate who God is. They're, they're, they're for our knowledge and understanding of who God is, who we are, what God is doing, what his purpose is, what his function is. That's the whole story of the whole Bible, and that's what Genesis does. We often look back at the stories in the Pentateuch and we say, why doesn't God just come out and say, having a whole bunch of wives is wrong. Why isn't it clearer? The genre of the way it's written is to illustrate that. When you read the stories of multiple wives, none of them end well. It's us to draw the conclusion. There it is in front of us. It doesn't have to say it. It's illustrated it. So when we go to the Old Testament, when we go to the Pentateuch, so much is stories that illustrate the problem or how God works. They illustrate it. And um, when we look at the creation story in particular in chapter 1, and I tried to emphasize it when, when I read it, there are elements of Hebrew poetry in it. There's repetition. There's parallelism. There's, there's things that make us say, oh, chapter 1 is a little bit different because of this repetition, because of the parallelism, because of the things that are there. And we just need to recognize that and not recognize it in a way that say, oh, it's just poetry, we don't believe it. No, recognize it for the beauty that's there. This is beautiful writing, ancient writing that's absolutely unparalleled. And if we don't see that part of it, we're missing out because it's there. Okay. All right, now here's another big one. Boy, time goes so fast. Here's another big one. Everybody's sitting down now. You're sitting down. Don't want anybody standing because you might faint when I say this. Creation is not a scientific account of how the worlds came into being. See, what happens with us is we live in a very scientific age. And what we want to do is we want to bring our understanding of science back and apply it to, to Genesis to say, well, is it true? Does it match? 
right? Remember I talked about, no, we don't do it that way. We look and see what the scripture says, and then we bring it up, and we apply it to our culture. So it's not a scientific account the way we understand science in, in, in the, the, the time that we live. And I want to tell you, there's, there's three reasons for that. And I bring this up because so many of us are scientists here, right? So many of us have an engineering background, a medical background. We, we all integrate with it. And it's something that as a Christian, at some point in your life, you've got to figure out how you understand this. So first of all, I want to tell you three things. Science and creation deal with a different subject. They each deal with a different subject. Science focuses on the repeatable, observable, testable effects of nature, the laws of nature, the theories of nature. Testable, repeatable, observable. The creation account focuses on God and the effects of God, specifically the effects of his spoken word. So two different subjects. It also, they use two different languages, right? If anybody has been in the science field at all, science utilizes precise technical terminology. And this type of language is not unknown in Scripture. If you read, read again, Luke or Acts, Luke was a physician. He was a trained physician. There are specific technical terms that Luke uses that if you know Greek and, and, and have access to Greek, it's like, oh, that's a technical term. So, so the Bible does not, is not blind to that. But I want to tell you, the creation account in particular <coughs> uses non-technical, everyday language that, again, exhibits several clear features found in Hebrew poetry. So different subject, a different language, and then third, this is the most important distinction of all. It answers different questions. Now, now hear me on this. Science is descriptive. It answers questions of how and what. Science would ask, how is light created? Using what processes and with what materials? And the answer would speak of photons and wavelengths and all that detail of how light maybe came into being. That's what science does. Genesis is prescriptive. It answers questions of who and why. Who and why. Genesis tells us who created the cosmos. Genesis tells us why it was created. Science, by definition, cannot answer those questions. Genesis does. Genesis, therefore, deals in the creation story with purpose and function and destiny. So different questions altogether. So I believe it is a mistake for us in 2023 to think that Genesis 1 is going to answer all our scientific questions. It's answering different questions using different terminology. Old Testament scholar John Walton says, are we so presumptuous to think that inspired text to be true must somehow incorporate our view of science into its discussion of origins? He calls this way of thinking intellectual imperialism forcing our way of thinking onto the text instead of letting the text form our way of thinking. And we certainly didn't do that with Genesis. So instead of insisting on imposing our 21st century scientific way of thinking on the ancient text, when we start with the text itself, the context it was written, the people it was written to, we must first understand how the original intended audience thousands of years ago understood it and then bring that understanding forward into our contemporary world. We must see the message of Genesis 1. 
first and foremost. What is God trying to teach you? What are the overarching truths that God is trying to show us? Nobody laughed. Nobody got up and ran out. That's pretty good. So let's get to the text. So I'm done the prologue. Let's get to the text. I want to look at, at the first two verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. These words are simple. They are, um, are majestic. They are profound. And the clear subject is God. That's what he wants us to see. The first sentence of the entire Bible begins with God. In the beginning, God. If you can't see that, you can't see anything. As the chapter unfolds, God dominates the chapter catches the eye at every point some 35 times in as many verses when you read the creation story. If you, under, if you go through and underline, you will find that 10 times in this account we read God said. Verse 3, and God said. Verse five, uh, 6, and God said. Verse 9, and God said. Verse 11, and God said. All the way through. It happens 10 times. Now, when was this written? In the wilderness, remember? <laughs> Moses wrote it down in the wilderness. They had been delivered from slavery. They had been brought out of Egypt. They were in the wilderness. And before they went to the wilderness, God called Moses up on the mountain and delivered something to him. What was it? Ten Commandments. The Decalogue. Do you know how the Hebrews refer to to creation the ten words the ten words it's all about God speaking the ten words we have the ten commandments we have the ten words it is God speaking to us and what is God doing he is speaking everything into creation it is his powerful word that does that it is God that is the instigator. It is God that is the active one. It is, the, it is God that speaks and the worlds are made. He is the creator. Right? That's what it teaches us. And we can get tied in knots about all kinds of things in Genesis 1. But if you don't have that, you don't have anything. It is God that speaks. The Hebrew word for created, by the way, is a, is a Hebrew word called bara. It's called bara. And it occurs about 50 times in the Old Testament. And uh, it has two characteristics. If you make a chart of every time the word bara occurs, guess who the subject is every single time? God. It's God that creates. The whole Old Testament proves it out. Every time the Hebrew word bara is used to say create, it is God that creates. And if you fill out that chart and say, okay, what is the subject of that verb? What does he create every time he creates with purpose? He's not interested in the material part of it. He's interested in creating things with purpose and function and destiny for, 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 for his creation to do something. That's the word. And what? And what does God create? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I want to tell you, this little phrase here is a, is, a, is a characteristic of Hebrew poetry. It's called a merism, a merism. It's using two divergent terms to describe everything in between. We do the same thing today. I looked high and low for that. High and low. That means I looked everywhere for it, right? It's a merism. It's a term where two divergent things are used to include everything. This is what it is. There's a, a verse in uh, Psalm 139 that says, God knows my rising up 
from my sitting down. Oh, he only knows those two things. No, no, no. It means that God knows everything about me. He knows every detail, every part of my life. God created the heavens and the earth. He created the whole cosmos and everything in between. And as it, as it uh, unfolds, the story goes, he created everything. So God created everything. The heavens and the earth are a merism. It's a technical term for two divergent things. That means everything in between. God created everything. Let's go to verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. What? It's a short verse. There's four or five descriptive terms that are used here. What is the picture that God is so desperately trying to paint for us? What did the Hebrews in the promised land think when they saw this description? There's no structure. There's no order. There's no boundaries. There's no inhabitants. It's dark. It's swirling with water. It is formless. It is empty. It is cloaked in inky darkness. And it's very, very wet. It has no purpose. It has no function. Scholars use the term chaos to describe it. Now, just a word on, on water for the Hebrews. If you look at the history of Israel, they were not a seagoing people. Again, thinking about the culture, thinking about the people. Now, um, Carters, I have three boys and a daughter. We are not good in the water. We, we, we will swim, but we thrash. It's not a pretty sight. We're more land animals, really. We, we like to run, we like to hike, we like to climb. And the Israelites were the same. They, were, they had a fear of the sea. They were not seagoing people. And so when you read all through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, you will see this picture of water and the seas used to represent chaos and judgment. They were not crazy about the water. And interestingly, when you go to the end, when you go to, to Revelation, when it talks about the new heavens and the new earth, guess what it says? And there was no more sea. Why? Because they hated it. They were afraid of it. They didn't like it. They weren't a sea. So, so what did they think? It's a bleak and scary picture. You guys like that? It's pretty good, huh? No, I'm not kidding. We have to understand the scripture to the people it was written to and what these terms meant to them. Once we do that, then we can apply the principle to us. That's what we do. And so when you hear that, it's like, now I get it. They didn't like the water. That's why water is all used all through without that. But then we also see it turned into something good, right? We see that something bad can be turned into something good. And we talk about the water of salvation. We talk about the living water. Jesus takes something that the culture thought was bad and he redeems it for good but that's another sermon don't get me on to that one man we'll go till two o'clock okay where am i it's a bleak and scary picture when they read this it was like they're shivering in their shoes it sounds horrible every description is negative and they would be like man that is not a place I want to go. But what do we see the scriptures say? And the Spirit of God was where? Hovering over those very waters. What did they think of that? What did that mean to them? What did they draw from that? What do you and I draw from that? Well, you and I immediately think of the whole New Testament understanding of the Trinity and the Spirit of God and all that. 
See, that wasn't fully developed for these guys back then. When you look at the word uh, a spirit in Hebrew, it's, it's ruah, and um, it can be translated wind. It can be translated breath, or it could be translated spirit. So what did they think when they heard that? Here's what I think. This is my thought. God's powerful presence was there, hovering, ready to work, ready to begin the creation process, to bring light to darkness, to bring order to disorder, to bring inhabitants to the empty, to bring function to the functionless, to bring purpose to chaos. God was there, inhaling and exhaling, breathing out his powerful spirit. There's tension. We're holding our breath expectantly. What's going to happen? God's breath hovers over the water. And God speaks and says, let there be light. And the creation story unfolds. And there was light. So, a couple of points to wrap it up. I know I didn't go very far, but that's my notion. Number one, number one. The overall theme of Genesis 1 is this. I'll say it a couple times. By his powerful word, the almighty sovereign God created the heavens and the earth, investing his creation with divine purpose, which is very good. Notice that contrary to the culture of that day when this was written down, it wasn't multiple gods, it was one God. It was one God that didn't bring the cosmos into existence by an epic battle of titans that you might see in the movies today. It was one God speaking creation into being. There was no pushback. There was no struggle. There was no battle. There was no resistance. God spoke, and it happened. Did you hear me pause every time when I read the portion, and it was so? God said, let there be light, and there was light. So in contrast to the culture and cosmology of the day, and the religious culture as well, it was one God speaking the creation into existence. If you look, uh, there's a verse in John chapter 1. If you'd put it up there, I, I'm just going to read it briefly. Um, and and it's, you're going to know it, of course. In the beginning, does that sound familiar? In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and we'll see how creation, the, the empty absence of life is filled with teeming life. In him was life. The life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and there was no battle. There was no pushback. There was no cosmic struggle. The light shined in the darkness, and the darkness was, has not overcome it. And then down in verse 14, the world became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We have seen his glory. We have seen his light in the face of Jesus. So if God is a speaking God, how does he speak today? Uh, just another verse, Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of God's glory. 
He is the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his purpose. You see it. You get it. Okay, point number one. The overall theme of Genesis 1 is by his powerful word, the almighty sovereign God created the heavens and the earth, investing his creation with divine purpose. And it was very good. Point two. The six days of creation are an exact answer to the description of the earth given in verse 2 without form and void or empty. Let me tell you what I mean by that. The word for um, without form in the Hebrew is tahu, and it means uh, without shape, without distinction, without boundaries, formless, shapeless. Without form, to who? The other word, which we translate as void, rhymes with it. It's behu, to who and behu. Kind of interesting. That's also Hebrew poetry where things rhyme. Uh, and it means uninhabited. It means empty. So without form and void is the initial description, formless and empty. Now get this. On the first three days of creation, we call it the first triad. God gave the heavens and the earth form. On the second triad, days four, five, and six, he put inhabitants in there. Right? So it wasn't empty. So he formed it on the first three days. To who? Answer to to who? And on the next three days, he filled it. The answer to the who. Do you ever see that before? It's a pattern that's there. The scholars have pointed out. So God's direct and personable response to to who, formless, was form, days one through three. And we'll talk about this next week, and, and I'll show you more of it. God's direct and personable, purposeful response to the who, empty, was to fill it, days four through six. So just one example, day one, let there be light. There was light. God saw the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. He called forth light, and he set up a period of light, one called day and the other dark. And uh, on day four, what happens? He takes that form, he takes that structure, and he fills it. And he says, okay, now I'm going to create two lights to fill that form. The greater light for the day, the lesser light for the night. And then he says, and here's his purpose for times and seasons and all that. So what did God really create in day one and four? He created time. He created time. And we'll talk more about that next week. So, and then day seven, as he goes through all that, day seven is the culmination. The overriding purpose of all creation was for God to rest, to take pleasure in what he had created. So last point, and I'm sorry this is going a little long. The description of God's first creative act is exactly how he works today. The scene is darkness, drowning waters, no form, no light. It's a desperate, dark, chaotic, fearful situation. And that's exactly where God is. Yeah? His powerful spirit is hovering, poised, ready to act, waiting for the command, and boom, it comes. And God says, let there be light, and there was light. When the night is darkest, when all hope is lost, when you feel like you're drowning, when you can't make sense of the chaos around you, the situation is utterly hopeless, when you're in utter darkness, that's when God can work. That's what he did. That's the whole story of the Bible. God shines light into darkness. That's when the morning star appears. That's when the sun of righteousness rises with healing in its wings. That's when the lamp shines in a dark place and the day dawn and the day star arises in our hearts. God speaks and we hear it and we believe it and through the power of the Spirit, we are a new creation. 
we are new people in the image of Christ. We are born again. We are, everything is new. That's how God works then. That's how God works through the Old Testament. That's how God works in the New Testament. That's how God works today. And he invests us with purpose and destiny. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship. Creation. He was the one that worked us. He is the potter. We are the clay. Created in Christ Jesus. Created in him. For good works. Which God has prepared beforehand. We have purpose and we have destiny. So many scriptures. Romans 8 talks about it. What is our destiny? To be like Christ. To be with him. To have our bodies transformed. To be with him forever. We have purpose and we have destiny. Something that science today says we are an accident, we are going to die, and then, then the lights are out and it's all over. Christianity teaches God created us with purpose and with destiny. And he works exactly like that today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for these verses. We thank you for Genesis written so long ago. I pray that you would help us to see the big picture, see what you are trying to let us see. Father, I pray that you would just help us to to clearly see that you are the creator and you still create. If there's anyone here that feels the chaos, that feels the darkness, I pray that your spirit would be hovering over them to bring light into darkness and to have a new creation.